plutonic rocks, rocks that are crystallizing at depth, at some depth, stuck there because they can't make it all the way to the surface. So we also have fancy names for this. We call them intrusive if they get stuck, and we call them extrusive if they're at the surface. That's just terminology. Really, it's the same material, right? It's still our liquefied green rock, and it gets modified on the way up. So it may not be the exact particle melts we start off with. I won't get into how they get modified, but nonetheless, you can change their composition slightly, and that's interesting in its own right. But we're starting off with that material, and whether it comes out at the surface or whether it stays underground really is just a function of cooling regimes. Because at the surface, you've got the air to move the heat away, and underground, you've got to move the heat away largely by conducting it through the other rocks. So if you have had an introductory geology course, you probably remember from it that the rocks at the surface are fine-grained. In other words, they have tiny little crystals in them. And the rocks deeper down have coarser grains, right? Because they're allowed to cool a little bit slower. That's the only difference. That's the only difference to me. We have different names we apply to the rocks as a consequence of their different <coughs> grain sizes. But the differences between the rocks involved are not ones of what's going on in the magma so much as cooling regimes. In other words, the rocks that we can see in active eruptions, this is a beautiful uh, picture from Montserrat's eruption in, in 97. That hot glowing material, that's the incandescence of hot molten rock. We call it lava when it reaches the surface, but we know this is just the re result of partial melting underneath the less, le lesser Antilles. This is where we're getting the, the partial melting today. Or we can look at places where the deep earth has been exposed because the overlying stuff has been stripped away over time. So the Wichita Mountains just north of here are an excellent place to do that. In fact, it's not much has been stripped away, so these are fairly near surface rocks. But nonetheless, what you're looking at here, every one of these light-colored rocks is a plutonic rock, the result of magma stalling somewhere in the crust, in this case near this crust, and crystallizing there. And we want to ask questions. We want to know what this area looked like when it was like this. What, what, what were the Wichita Mountains like when they were actively erupting? And they were actively erupting. There were large packages of volcanic rocks that are still preserved as well. So we know that we had rocks, magmas making it to the surface. We know we have magmas trapped in the subsurface. And we want to ask the questions, okay, well, what are these things about? How do they relate to the partial melting that's going on beneath? How are they telling us about the Earth and its behavior during that time? If you apply chronology, radiometric chronology, to this rocks, in fact, you can date this one right here. It's been dated at 542 million years, plus or minus 2 million years, uh, using the zircon crystals in it. You know what part of the Earth's history you're dealing with, and that's actually a fun time in Earth history. That's when life, uh, life is really growing abundantly in the marine environment at that time. But onshore, we're getting lots and lots of, of exciting things going on in, in what's now southern Oklahoma due to the fact that we stretched the crust there and caused decompression melting of the mantle underneath, producing all of these rocks that you see there. How are we going to get to this information? I mean, there's, there's all sorts of information out there on a number of scales. There's mappable information in the sense you can walk around and say, well, the pink rocks are here and the dark rocks are here. I actually get my daughters to do this kind of work. My daughters are uh, seven and ten years old, so they're not, you know, advanced scientists yet. But they can tell the difference between a pink rock and a black rock really easily. So I can send them out of here and go, where? Go stand on a pink rock for me, and I'll come map you in. And that's really easy work for them to do it. But they think it's great. They think that's all I do. But then they think it's great. So, uh, yeah, Daddy, you're gonna go do more pink rocks today. Yep. No more pink rocks today. But nonetheless, that's very helpful information. Spatial distribution, its relation to how it was put into the Earth to begin with, and its relation to how the Earth is being dissected today, because there's streams running down through here, and you can see fracture sets coming through here as well. That's all important information. I want to take us in back to the lab, so if you would take some of these samples in, what kind of questions would you ask? This is actually an example of the pink rock from up there in the last photo. This is the Mount Scott granite, and it's a, it's a nice looking granite that's kind of finer grain. Uh, but what it does have in it is a variety of individual crystal grains of minerals. Minerals is a name that geologists applies to a consistent set of chemistry that's stacked a certain way inside that crystal. In other words, 
Um, we call it the lattice, but basically if you have something like quartz here, which is probably the easiest one to talk about, if you have a quartz grain like this little transparent grain here, you have something that's made entirely, well, almost entirely, out of silicon and oxygen. So those are your principal components that make up that solid material. And that solid material, those silicons and oxygens are stacked a certain way. And that stacking is completely response to temperature and pressure while it's growing from the magma. And that's powerful information. In other words, if we had some other form of silicon and oxygen in there, we know that our temperature and pressure regimes were highly different. Now I said almost entirely because uh, you can't keep other things out. So although if you analyze this, it would be mostly silicon and oxygen, you might find trace amounts of titanium, for example. In fact, that can be very useful. Trace amounts of titanium, if you know anything about chemistry, silicon and titanium are both quadrivalent cations. In other words, they can uh, easily lose four electrons and bond in the same kind of configuration. They're not all that different in size. They're slightly different. And that means if you're trying to build a structure like a brick wall, you know, the lattice is like a brick wall, you can pop in an occasional titanium and get away with it. It's like a slightly smaller brick, but it's okay. Uh, or you can build the whole thing out of silicon. It really depends on you know what your temperatures are and how you can do that. I'm going to say something about Sveen doing the same thing. Sveens are kind of hard to see in this rock, but it's in this black cluster here. Some of these minerals are easy to understand, like quartz. There's just two principal components in quartz. Uh, and then there are others. This isn't even, oh no, I don't know that F got in there, but uh, that extra F in there should be over on this end. It, it, it should, because we usually like to keep these together. <laughs> but it's in there. You can see, oh my goodness, there's half the periodic table in there. Well, no, not quite. But nonetheless, we do consider minerals these greenish black grains right in here, like horn blend garbage cans, because they are so adept at incorporating a lot of different elements. And essentially a good horn blend is made up of the common elements you would see in a rock, so lots of different stuff in there. And in fact, my Summer You Grow project, we're going to try to focus on, on horn blends and other amphiboles, because they are so diverse, they, they have a lot of room for, for figuring things out. So again, this is the rock, I'll go back one side, got it from an area like this, I think it's, this one's from further west, but nonetheless, area like that, brought it back to the lab, sawed it open, and then start asking the questions, what do these individual little pieces tell us about the rock history? All right, well I do want to make this point clear, is what we're doing is we're saying the little pieces in there are, a, they're recording the environment that they've been through, ever since they were a magma. Can think about that's when they were little babies. Little babies in the magma, they're responding to their environment just like a baby will. You know, if the parents are attentive, then you get a different baby than if the parents are abusive, for example. Same thing, you can only make these things out of what's in the magma. So if you don't have any titanium in the magma, you're not going to get minerals like steam because they incorporate titanium in them. Uh, if you have abundant zirconium in the magma, for example, another element. It can substitute for some of that titanium. It's not a direct substitution, but you can get a little bit of zirconium into these sphene crystals. And that, again, is a function of the temperatures and pressures at which you're crystallizing this. And, of course, the concentration of zirconium that you have in this melt. Magmas are wonderful places because you got all of these different components floating around, basically unaffiliated. I mean, that's not exactly true. They, do, they sort of start to form little clusters, but essentially unaffiliated with a mineral. And then the minerals start to grow, and you know they have to choose size. Well, they don't really choose size. But, <laughs> you know, that if you're a titanium, you don't have a lot of choices. You know, you're not gonna go into to a lot of different crystals in abundance. So you get selected into the crystals that are growing. And they don't all grow at once, so that's even fascinating information. We could get into that. And even individual grains go through stages of growth. So you can actually see variations in composition that start at the center of a grain and move outward. Um, one thing I should say about the last rock, I've got a scale bar here. This is a centimeter. So these are considered the big grains in this particular rock. And you can get bigger grains in some rocks. But most of geology is down on this scale if you want to talk about these individual grains. Sub-centimeter, even sub-millimeter. We're getting down into the micron scale to actually assess what we want to know about this. So we need to ask the kind of questions that are going to happen on very, very small scales. 
Fortunately for guys like me, the last 30 years in uh, analytical chemistry and analytical geochemistry have been focused on getting us to smaller and smaller scales, and we've greatly benefited from that. We have to ask ourselves if we want to ask questions about, you know, how much zirconium do you have? Well, then we need to be able to identify what elements are present in our minerals. And again, let me just stress this. If you look at the, uh, what we call empirical formula, the chemical formula for a good sphene crystal, you don't see any zirconium in there because it's not a major component. You're never going to fill all of the titanium sites with zirconiums. That's just not going to happen. It can't work. It's, it's, uh, Dr. Brink would actually you know, point to a phase diagram at this point and say, you can't do this. You can't put that much zirconium in there. But you can put a little in there, again, because it fits. It just doesn't fit so well. If you want to know that, then you've got to have tools that able, are able to say, hey, there's a zirconium atom. Actually, there's you know, a bajillion zirconium atoms in here as opposed to two bajillion zirconium atoms in here. So we need tools that will let us do that. And again, a lot of our work over the last hundred years has been finding rapid ways to do that. You can, of course, with any rock or any material, grind it down into a powder, dissolve it in acid, and titrate the heck out of it with different compounds, and find each and every ion in that. And it will take you the better part of a month. So we don't want to take a month to do this. We got budgets and time. If we did that for you, grow. You would get one element done, and that would be it. Yeah, it's not, not very productive. For one little sample, that's not very productive. And we've known this for a long time. The important thing is to find ways to rapidly characterize it that don't lose any accuracy in the process. We still want that information that we get from going to a lab and dissolving things in acid and plucking out the ions one by one. If you've had an analytical chemistry class or have been exposed to this at all, you've done some of these experiments that allow you to say, oh, yeah, I know exactly what ions are in there. So we, there are some powerful physical tools that we can use to get around having to do a lot of work. And this is the principle behind many of them. This, the principle I'm going to talk about first is, is basically energy spectrometry. Being able to take energies and have them relate to something specific that we want to know about. So. It starts with this. It starts in the atoms themselves. So one thing that's really neat about each of the elements on the periodic table is they have their own individual electron structures. And that's just a consequence of their attraction to the nucleus. So a hydrogen is different from a helium because it's got a different electron structure. You can tell it's different from it. What we need is a tool that allows us to say, oh, which electron structure are we looking at? Well, it turns out thanks to you know, the work that came out of physics 100 years ago from the likes of Niels Bohr, we are able to quantify the specific changes in electron configurations as they move from point to point inside an atom. Now at, at room temperature, which is going to be 273.15 degrees K, we're close. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of this going on all the time, but not enough to sort of make sense of it. Usually we want to get things really excited so we can get the electrons to move up and down in their atoms. If they move down, and that's what this slide is trying to say, if the electron moves down so that it goes from a higher energy to a lower energy state, that jump is not arbitrary. For each element, it is characteristic. It has a, a, a specific signal to it. And this actually is the Bohr equation for that. In other words, the energy that you'll get out of it is equivalent to uh, a big number called the Planck's constant uh, times the frequency of the energy that you get, which is uh, just a function of the wavelength of the energy that you get. And this actually builds on uh, Einstein's other Nobel Prize. Everybody knows he got the Nobel Prize for relativity, but he also got a Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect, which basically says that you, know, you can apply light to materials and get electrons produced from it. This is exactly what he's talking about. The antithesis of that is true. You get the electrons to move, you get light. In fact, that is light. Uh, that's what Maxwell was saying. So the fluorescent lights, the projector, we got electrons moving, therefore you can see things. That's, that's what's happening. Well, it turns out that we're getting highly specific movements that we can use to characterize what's in our light sources. 